A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 17 A Costly Recapture. As the speaker ceased, he turned to leave the apartment by the door where I was standing, but I needed to wait no longer. I had heard enough to fill my soul with dread, and stealing quietly away, I returned to the courtyard by the way I had come. My plan of action was formed upon the instant, and crossing the square and the bordering avenue upon the opposite side, I soon stood within the courtyard of Tal Hajis. The brilliantly lighted apartments on the first floor told me where first to seek, and advancing to the windows I peered within. I soon discovered that my approach was not to be the easy thing I had hoped, for the rear rooms bordering the court were filled with warriors and women. I then glanced up at the stories above, discovering that the third was apparently unlighted, and so decided to make my entrance to the building from that point. It was the work of but a moment for me to reach the windows above, and soon I had drawn myself within the sheltering shadows of the unlighted third floor. Fortunately, the room I had selected was untenanted, and creeping noiselessly to the corridor beyond, I discovered a light in the apartments ahead of me. Reaching what appeared to be a doorway, I discovered that it was but an opening upon an immense inner chamber which towered from the first floor, two stories below me, to the dome-like roof of the building, high above my head. The floor of this great circular hall was thronged with chieftains, warriors, and women, and at one end was a great raised platform upon which squatted the most hideous beast I had ever put my eyes upon. He had all the cold, hard, cruel, terrible features of the green warriors, but accentuated and debased by the animal passions to which he had given himself over for many years. There was not a mark of dignity or pride upon his bestial countenance, while his enormous bulk spread itself out upon the platform where he squatted like some huge devil-fish his six limbs accentuating the similarity in a horrible and startling manner. But the sight that froze me with apprehension was the sight of Dejah Thoris and Sola standing there before him, and the fiendish leer of him as he let his great protruding eyes gloat upon the lines of her beautiful figure. She was speaking, but I could not hear what she said, nor could I make out the low grumbling of his reply. She stood there erect before him, her head high held, and even at the distance I was from them I could read the scorn and disgust upon her face, as she let her haughty glance rest without sign of fear upon him. She was indeed the proud daughter of a thousand jeddaks, every inch of her dear, precious little body. So small, so frail beside the towering warriors around her but in her majesty dwarfing them into insignificance. She was the mightiest figure among them, and I verily believe that they felt it. Presently Talhadjus made a sign that the chamber be cleared, and that the prisoners be left alone before him. Slowly the chieftains, the warriors, and the women melted away into the shadows of the surrounding chambers and Dejah Thoris and Sola stood alone before the Jeddak of the Tharks. One chieftain alone had hesitated before departing. I saw him standing in the shadows of a mighty column, his fingers nervously toying with the hilt of his greatsword, and his cruel eyes bent in implacable hatred upon Tal Hajis. It was Tars Tarkas and I could read his thoughts as they were an open book for the undisguised loathing upon his face. He was thinking of that other woman, who, forty years ago, had stood before this beast, and could I have spoken a word into his ear at that moment, the reign of Tal Hajis would have been over. But finally he also strode from the room, not knowing that he left his own daughter at the mercy of the creature he most loathed. Tal Hajis arose, and I, half fearing, half anticipating his intentions, hurried to the winding runway which led to the floors below. No one was near to intercept me, and I reached the main floor of the chamber unobserved, 
taking my station in the shadow of the same column that Taras Tarkas had but just deserted. As I reached the floor, Tal Hedges was speaking. "'Princess of Helium, I might wring a mighty ransom from your people, would I but return you to them unharmed. But a thousand times rather would I watch that beautiful face writhe in the agony of torture. It shall be long drawn out, that I promise you. Ten days of pleasure were all too short to show the love I harbor for your race. The terrors of your death shall haunt the slumbers of the red men through all the ages to come. They will shudder in the shadows of the night as their fathers tell them of the awful vengeance of the green men, of the power and might and hate and cruelty of Tal Hajus. But before the torture you shall be mine for one short hour, and the word of that too shall go forth to Tardos Mors, Jeddak of Helium, your grandfather, that he may grovel upon the ground in the agony of his sorrow. Tomorrow the torture will commence. Tonight thou art Tal Hajus. Come. He sprang down from the platform and grasped her roughly by the arm, but scarcely had he touched her than I leaped between them. My short sword, sharp and gleaming, was in my right hand. I could have plunged it into his putrid heart before he realized that I was upon him. But as I raised my arm to strike, I thought of Tars Tarkas, and with all my rage, with all my hatred, I could not rob him of that sweet moment for which he had lived and hoped all these long, weary years. And so instead I swung my good right fist full upon the point of his jaw. Without a sound he slipped to the floor as one dead. In the same deathly silence I grasped Dejah Thoris by the hand, and motioning Sola to follow, we sped noiselessly from the chamber and to the floor above. Unseen we reached a rear window, and with the straps and leather of my trappings I lowered first Sola and then Dejah Thoris to the ground below. Dropping lightly after them, I drew them rapidly around the court in the shadows of the buildings, and thus we returned over the same course I had so recently followed from the distant boundary of the city. We finally came upon my thoats in the courtyard where I had left them, and placing the trappings upon them we hastened through the building to the avenue beyond. Mounting, Sola upon one beast, and Dejah Thoris behind me upon the other, we rode from the city of Thark through the hills to the south. Instead of circling back around the city to the northwest and toward the nearest waterway which lay so short a distance from us, we turned to the northeast and struck out upon the mossy waste across which, for two hundred dangerous and weary miles, lay another main artery leading to Helium. No word was spoken until we had left the city far behind, but I could hear the quiet sobbing of Dejah Thoris as she clung to me with her dear head resting against my shoulder. "'If we make it, my chieftain, the debt of Helium will be a mighty one, greater than she can ever pay you. And should we not make it,' she continued, "'the debt is no less, though Helium will never know, for you have saved the last of our line from worse than death.'" I did not answer but instead reached to my side and pressed the little fingers of her I loved, where they clung to me for support. And then, in unbroken silence, we sped over the yellow moonlit moss, each of us occupied with his own thoughts. For my part I could not be other than joyful had I tried, with Dejah Thoris' warm body pressed close to mine, and with all our unpassed danger my heart was singing as gaily as though we were already entering the gates of Helium. Our earlier plans had been so sadly upset that we now found ourselves without food or drink, and I alone was armed. We therefore urged our beasts to a speed that must tell on them sorely before we could hope to sight the end of the first stage of our journey. We rode all night and all the following day with only a few short rests. On the second night both we and our animals were completely fagged, 
and so we lay down upon the moss and slept for some five or six hours, taking up the journey once more before daylight. All the following day we rode, and when, late in the afternoon, we had sighted no distant trees, the mark of the great waterways throughout all Barsoom, the terrible truth flashed upon us. We were lost. Evidently we had circled, but which way it was difficult to say, nor did it seem possible with the sun to guide us by day and the moons and stars by night. At any rate no waterway was in sight, and the entire party was almost ready to drop from hunger, thirst, and fatigue. Far ahead of us, and a trifle to the right, we could distinguish the outlines of low mountains. These we decided to attempt to reach, in the hope that from some ridge we might discern the missing waterway. Night fell upon us before we reached our goal, and almost fainting from weariness and weakness, we lay down and slept. I was awakened early in the morning by some huge body pressing close to mine and opening my eyes with a start I beheld my blessed old Woola snuggling close to me. The faithful brute had followed us across that trackless waste to share our fate, whatever it might be. Putting my arms about his neck I pressed my cheek close to his. Nor am I ashamed that I did it, nor of the tears that came to my eyes as I thought of his love for me. Shortly after this Dejah Thoris and Sola awakened, and it was decided that we push on at once in an effort to gain the hills. We had gone scarcely a mile when I noticed that my thoat was commencing to stumble and stagger in a most pitiful manner, although we had not attempted to force them out of a walk since about noon of the preceding day. Suddenly he lurched wildly to one side and pitched violently to the ground. Dejah Thoris and I were thrown clear of him and fell upon the soft moss with scarcely a jar. But the poor beast was in a pitiable condition, not even being able to rise, although relieved of our weight. Sola told me that the coolness of the night when it fell, together with the rest, would doubtless revive him, and so I decided not to kill him, as was my first intention, as I had thought it cruel to leave him alone there to die of hunger and thirst. Relieving him of his trappings, which I flung down beside him, we left the poor fellow to his fate, and pushed on with the one thoat as best we could. Sola and I walked, making Deja Thoris ride, much against her will. In this way we had progressed to within about a mile of the hills we were endeavouring to reach when Deja Thoris, from her point of vantage upon the thoat, cried out that she saw a great party of mounted men filing down from a pass in the hills several miles away. Sola and I both looked in the direction she indicated, and there, plainly discernible, were several hundred mounted warriors. They seemed to be headed in a southwesterly direction, which would take them away from us. They doubtless were Thark warriors who had been set out to capture us, and we breathed a great sigh of relief that we were travelling in the opposite direction. Quickly lifting Deja Thoris from the thoat, I commanded the animal to lie down, and we three did the same, presenting as small an object as possible for fear of attracting the attention of the warriors toward us. We could see them as they filed out of the pass, just for an instant, before they were lost to view behind a friendly ridge. To us a most providential ridge. Since, had they been in view for any great length of time, they scarcely could have failed to discover us. As what proved to be the last warrior came into view from the pass, we halted, and to our consternation threw his small but powerful field-glass to his eye and scanned the sea-bottom in all directions. Evidently he was a chieftain for in certain marching formations among the green men a chieftain brings up the extreme rear of the column. As his glass swung toward us our hearts stopped in our breasts, and I could feel the cold sweat start from every pore in my body. Presently it swung full upon us, and stopped. The tension on our nerves was near the breaking point and I doubt if any of us breathed for the few moments he held us covered by his glass. 
and then he lowered it, and we could see him shout a command to the warriors who had passed from our sight beyond the ridge. He did not wait for them to join him, however, instead he wheeled his throat and came tearing madly in our direction. There was but one slight chance, and that we must take quickly. Raising my strange Martian rifle to my shoulder, I sighted and touched the button which controlled the trigger. There was a sharp explosion as the missile reached its goal, and the charging chieftain pitched backward from his flying mount. Springing to my feet, I urged the thoat to rise, and directed Sola to take Dejah Thoris with her upon him and make a mighty effort to reach the hills before the green warriors were upon us. I knew that in the ravines and gullies they might find a temporary hiding place, and even though they died there of hunger and thirst, it would be better so than that they fell into the hands of the Tharks. Forcing my two revolvers upon them as a slight means of protection, and, as a last resort, as an escape for themselves from the horrid death which recapture would surely mean, I lifted Dejah Thoris in my arms and placed her upon the thoat behind Sola, who had already mounted at my command. "'Good-bye, my princess,' I whispered. "'We may meet in Helium yet. I have escaped from worse plights than this.' and I tried to smile as I lied. "'What?' she cried. "'Are you not coming with us?' "'How may I, Dejah Thoris? Someone must hold these fellows off for a while, and I can better escape them alone than could the three of us together.' She sprang quickly from the thoat, and throwing her dear arms about my neck, turned to Sola, saying with quiet dignity, "'Fly, Sola. Dejah Thoris remains to die with the man she loves. Those words are engraved upon my heart. Ah, gladly would I give up my life a thousand times could I only hear them once again. But I could not then give even a second to the rapture of her sweet embrace, and pressing my lips to hers for the first time, I picked her up bodily and tossed her to her seat behind Sola again, commanding the latter in peremptory tones to hold her there by force and then, slapping the thoat upon the flank, I saw them borne away, Dejah Thora struggling to the last to free herself from Sola's grasp. Turning, I beheld the green warriors mounting the ridge and looking for their chieftain. In a moment they saw him, and then me. But scarcely had they discovered me than I commenced firing, lying flat upon my belly in the moss. I had an even hundred rounds in the magazine of my rifle, and another hundred in the belt at my back, and I kept up a continuous stream of fire until I saw all of the warriors who had been first to return from behind the ridge, either dead or scurrying to cover. My respite was short-lived, however, for soon the entire party, numbering some thousand men, came charging into view, racing madly toward me. I fired until my rifle was empty and they were almost upon me. And then a glance showing me that Dejah Thoris and Sola had disappeared among the hills, I sprang up, throwing down my useless gun, and started away in the direction opposite to that taken by Sola and her charge. If ever Martians had an exhibition of jumping, it was granted those astonished warriors on that day long years ago but while it led them away from Dejah Thoris, it did not distract their attention from endeavoring to capture me. They raced wildly after me, until, finally, my foot struck a projecting piece of quartz, and down I went, sprawling upon the moss. As I looked up they were upon me, and although I drew my long-sword in an attempt to sell my life as dearly as possible, it was soon over. I reeled beneath their blows which fell upon me in perfect torrents. My head swam, all was black, and I went down beneath them to oblivion. CHAPTER Eighteen, CHAINED IN WARHOON It must have been several hours before I regained consciousness, and I well remember the feeling of surprise which swept over me as I realized that I was not dead. I was lying among a pile of sleeping silks and furs in the corner of a small room in which were several green warriors, and bending over me was an ancient and ugly female. 
As I opened my eyes she turned to one of the warriors, saying, "'He will live, O Jed.' "'Tis well,' replied the one so addressed, rising and approaching my couch. "'He should render rare sport for the great games.' And now, as my eyes fell upon him, I saw that he was no Thark, for his ornaments and metal were not of that horde. He was a huge fellow, terribly scarred about the face and chest, and with one broken tusk and a missing ear. Strapped on either breast were human skulls, and appending from these a number of dried human hands. His reference to the great games of which I had heard so much while among the Tharks convinced me that I had but jumped from purgatory into Gehenna. After a few more words with the female, during which she assured him that I was now fully fit to travel, the Jed ordered that we mount and ride after the main column. I was strapped securely to as wild and unmanageable a thoat as I had ever seen, and with a mounted warrior on either side to prevent the beast from bolting, we rode forth at a furious pace in pursuit of the column. My wounds gave me but little pain, so wonderfully and rapidly had the applications and injections of the female exercised their therapeutic powers, and so deftly had she bound and plastered the injuries. Just before dark we reached the main body of troops shortly after they had made camp for the night. I was immediately taken before the leader, who proved to be the Jeddak of the hordes of Warhoon. Like the Jed, who had brought me, he was frightfully scarred, and also decorated with the breastplate of human skulls and dried dead hands, which seemed to mark all the greater warriors among the Warhoons, as well as to indicate their awful ferocity, which greatly transcends even that of the Tharks. The Jeddak, Bar Comus, who was comparatively young, was the object of the fierce and jealous hatred of his old lieutenant, Dak Kova, the Jed who had captured me, and I could not but note the almost studied efforts which the latter made to affront his superior. He entirely omitted the usual formal salutation as we entered the presence of the Jeddak, and as he pushed me roughly before the ruler he exclaimed in a loud and menacing voice, I have brought a strange creature wearing the metal of a Thark, whom it is my pleasure to have battle with a wild thoat at the great games. He will die as Bar Comas, your Jeddak, sees fit, if at all, replied the young ruler, with emphasis and dignity. If at all, roared Dak Kova, by the dead hands at my throat, but he shall die, Bar Comas. No maudlin weakness on your part shall save him. Oh, would that Warhoon were ruled by a real Jeddak, rather than a water-hearted weakling from whom even old Dak Kova could tear the metal with his bare hands!" Bar Comas eyed the defiant and insubordinate chieftain for an instant, his expression one of haughty, fearless contempt and hate and then, without drawing a weapon, and without uttering a word, he hurled himself at the throat of his defamer. I never before had seen two green Martian warriors battle with nature's weapons, and the exhibition of animal ferocity which ensued was as fearful a thing as the most disordered imagination could picture. They tore at each other's eyes and ears with their hands, and with their gleaming tusks repeatedly slashed and gored until both were cut fairly to ribbons from head to foot. Bar Comus had much the better of the battle, as he was stronger, quicker, and more intelligent. It soon seemed that the encounter was done, saving only the final thrust which Bear Comus slipped in, breaking away from a clinch. It was the one little opening that Dak Kova needed, and hurling himself at the body of his adversary he buried his single mighty tusk in Bar Comus groin, and with a last powerful effort ripped the young Jeddak wide open the full length of his body, the great tusk finally wedging in the bones of Bar Comus jaw. Victor and vanquished rolled limp and lifeless upon the moss a huge mass of torn and bloody flesh. Barcomus was stone dead, 
and only the most Herculean efforts on the part of Dakova's females saved him from the fate he deserved. Three days later he walked without assistance to the body of Bar Comus, which by custom had not been moved from where it fell, and placing his foot upon the neck of his erstwhile ruler he assumed the title of Jeddak of Warhoon. The dead Jeddak's hands and head were removed to be added to the ornaments of his conqueror, and then his women cremated what remained, amid wild and terrible laughter. The injuries to Dakova had delayed the march so greatly that it was decided to give up the expedition, which was a raid upon a small Thark community in retaliation for the destruction of the incubator, until after the great games, and the entire body of warriors, ten thousand in number, turned back toward Warhoon. My introduction to these cruel and bloodthirsty people was but an index to the scenes I witnessed almost daily while with them. They were a smaller horde than the Tharks, but much more ferocious. Not a day passed but that some members of the various Warhoon communities met in deadly combat. I have seen as high as eight mortal duels within a single day. We reached the city of Warhoon after some three days' march and I was immediately cast into a dungeon and heavily chained to the floor and walls. Food was brought me at intervals, but owing to the utter darkness of the place I do not know whether I lay there days or weeks or months. It was the most horrible experience of all my life, and that my mind did not give way to the terrors of that inky blackness has been a wonder to me ever since. The place was filled with creeping, crawling things cold, sinuous bodies passed over me when I lay down, and in the darkness I occasionally caught glimpses of gleaming, fiery eyes, fixed in horrible intentness upon me. No sound reached me from the world above, and no word would my jailer vouchsafe when my food was brought to me, although I at first bombarded him with questions. Finally, all the hatred and maniacal loathing for these awful creatures who had placed me in this horrible place was centered by my tottering reason upon this single emissary who represented to me the entire horde of Warhoons. I had noticed that he always advanced with his dim torch to where he could place the food within my reach, and as he stooped to place it upon the floor his head was about on a level with my breast. So, with the cunning of a madman, I backed into the far corner of my cell when next I heard him approaching, and gathering a little slack of the great chain which held me in my hand, I waited his coming, crouching like some beast of prey. As he stooped to place my food upon the ground, I swung the chain above my head and crashed the links with all my strength upon his skull. Without a sound he slipped to the floor, stone dead. Laughing and chattering like the idiot I was fast becoming, I fell upon his prostrate form, my fingers feeling for his dead throat. Presently they came in contact with a small chain at the end of which dangled a number of keys. The touch of my fingers on these keys brought back my reason with the suddenness of thought. No longer was I a gibbering idiot, but a sane, reasoning man with the means of escape within my very hands. As I was groping to remove the chain from about my victim's neck, I glanced up into the darkness to see six pairs of gleaming eyes fixed, unwinking upon me. Slowly they approached, and slowly I shrank back from the awful horror of them. Back into my corner I crouched, holding my hands palms out before me, and stealthily on came the awful eyes until they reached the dead body at my feet. Then, slowly, they retreated, but this time with a strange grating sound, and finally they disappeared in some black and distant recess of my dungeon. End of chapter 18